All right, greetings, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. Um, lady president, I'm gonna make you co-host for the art. I got you a co-host as well, but I need y'all keep y'all eye. Okay, we got some, yeah, this one of our guests coming in. I need to keep y'all eye on the um, waiting room. Okay. Okay, so we are recording, brothers and sisters. Um, you know, you don't, you know, don't you don't have to speak and don't have to turn your camera on if you don't want to. Uh, tonight is February sixth, two thousand and twenty-four. I left my glasses in the car, um, but it's okay. It's all right. Uh, tonight is session nineteen of the Dr. Julius Nairi CBPM Division of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. This is our officers training. Uh, we are going through message to the people, of course, of African philosophy, uh, as taught by the right excellent Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Tonight, we're going over the questions from lesson 17, titled Communism, and we'll be doing a reading for lesson 18, titled Commercial and Industrial Intercourse. Um, Questions that we do. Oh, uh, yeah, before we get to our questions, as always, we do our pledge to the red, black, and green flag. If you would, uh, please come off mute for those that know the words and say it along with me. <clears throat> I commit my I commit body, my body, body mind, mind, and spirit, spirit, spirit to the protection, protection defense, defense, and security, and security of the red, of the black, red black, black, and green. Mm -hmm. I dedicate my, I life, dedicate my life to the redemption of, of, mother, of mother Africa. Africa. And the, and the liberation of her scattered black children. I accept for myself, for myself and my descendants, my descendants the teachers, teach, the teachers of universal African nationalism. And I promise, I promise that our children will be instilled with the purpose, the purpose knowledge, and knowledge of themselves of as African people, African people. In, order that the in order that the cause of our struggle will neither falter nor fail until all black all black people are free, are free and united through one God, one aim, one destiny, one destiny. Race first, race first. Okay, <clears throat> officially open up our meeting. Um, roll. I'll do a brief roll call. I have myself, brother John, uh, president. We have our lady president, sister Ra Ebony, uh, council general attorney Emotep. We have our uh, lady. Vice President, Sister Diane. Uh, we have an uh, officer in training, uh, Brother Malik, uh, another officer in training, Brother Eric, and our secretary, uh, Brother Art. And we also have two uh, guests that are that are with us uh, tonight. So thank you, uh, everyone, for joining. Um, I'll, I'll go through I'll go through those two questions and then I'm gonna do a, a brief just for the the guests to let them know what we're doing, uh, what they're. Um, witnessing um but to finish up with our discussion from earlier and what is the most dominant propaganda item in the lives of our people um what what i've got is holy bible uh, the holy bible itself uh, as we've gone through this text um it has it has come up you know time and time again from the first lesson um all the way through lesson 16 17 you know and we'll we'll continue to touch on um, the Bible, but from a historical perspective, one thing that we have to remember, especially from a propaganda perspective, um, as, as, as we, as we, uh, as we learned yesterday, per Mr. Garvey's perspective, propaganda means to propagate or to make known. Um, when you look up the study or the history of the, the Bible, the Holy Bible, it was one of the first, and I think the first um, text to be made in mass, to be mass produced. Um, so, you know, from an indoctrination standpoint, um, it had the earliest start um, and it's still one of the most read and most purchased um, text, you know, uh, in, in modern time. So, um, I agree with Brother Malik. I would go towards the religious text. Uh, Quran is 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 up there as well, um, creeping, you know, 
probably probably ne neck and neck uh, with the Bible. But again, from a historical perspective, the Quran only has 600 years. Um, the Bible at 2000 years, um, somewhere around there, 1700 years or something. All right. Uh, questions, comments on that? Uh, most dominant propaganda item in our lives today and in the lives of our people as well. But that's also part of the reason why Mr. Garvey says that we have to understand that text. Um, even if we don't agree with it, it's not it's not necessarily something that we have to um, uh, uh, pray to or yeah, believe in, but it is something that we have to understand. <clears throat> All right. Um, and next question: What is the UNIA's uh, UNIA ACL's form of propaganda? Um, how does the what is yeah what is the UNIA's propaganda? What is our propaganda? And I'm speaking more from a parent body level, not a divisional level. But if you want to give a divisional answer, that's great as well. What is our propaganda? We should know that. We are officers. We are leaders. Um, if individuals are asking us, hey, we want information on the UNIA. What is the UNIA doing? Where do we direct our people? Is it the Constitution? Ah, I will, that look, look, that's Council General answer. Um, you can't go wrong with the Constitution. You know, that's a, that's a, that's. That's like Bible at church. Um, but message to message the people. To the message to the people? Brother Malik? Yeah. No, not message to the people. Teachings of African nationalism. Teachings of African nationalism. Y'all are getting into the, that's the principles, but I'm talking about, again, from a Holy Bible perspective, um, what is something tangible that we can give to individuals right now um, for, oh, for the I, Constitution. The Constitution, yes, but but that's not why. Um, oh, no, we don't. We wouldn't. Yeah, we don't. I mean, just think about it. If we do, no, like the Constitution is good, but if we just went around giving giving out the Constitution, no, that that thing has to come with a a course of understanding. Um, all right, y'all, y'all. We it's, it's eight twenty. We still got a lot to do. The government website, number one, uh, we direct individuals to our government website. Uh, for those that have not seen it, let me pause, share, make sure, because I got some work up here. Okay, I was just doing single screen. Um, please forgive my internet connection. Um, but but that's one is our website. Um again, well, let's 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 take it back. Maybe I should have asked it this way. What was Garvey's most dominant form of propaganda in his time? The Negro World. Negro World newspaper, yes. So yeah. So we're in a digital age, we're in an internet age. Um, you know, this is somewhat of our modern day Negro world, um, if, if, if everyone follows that. Uh, but a lot of promotion um, is done through internet uh, nowadays. So, um, you know, if we don't have an online presence, that's almost just as bad, or it could be worse than, than not having a physical uh, presence AAA. -A -A. What about the uh, CBPM or the whirlwind? Those are more local. Um, those are more divisional. So mm -hmm. that's okay. that's those are great answers, but those are those are local. Uh, with as well, you know, new whirlwind newsletter uh, is definitely Garvey's a, voice. Ah, look at you! Look at you! <laughs> there, there, that yes, you you going back to yes national promotion. Garvey's Voice uh, magazine would be the second, uh, and that is actually on the UNIA website as well. Uh, so from a parent body propaganda standpoint, um, from, you know, trying to keep everything on the same page um, for us to speak the same language as, you know, our brothers and sisters in Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, um, 
it's it's you know it's the Garvey's voice. Uh, it's the it's the UNIA web page. So, uh, from a local standpoint, it'll definitely be our newsletter, uh, our social media. Um, you know, yes, definitely from a local level, but from a a national level, uh, it would be Garvey's Voice Magazine and our web page. So questions, comments on that? Propaganda, very important though. Um, and we have to propagate our message. And that's, these are, we have to know the ways in which we are doing that. So uh, if there aren't any questions, we will. I have a quick question. Um, who prints the Garvey's Voice magazine? Uh, Brother Raymond Duguay. Oh, wow. Okay. Out of, out of, out of Queens. Um, okay. First assistant, vice president, and, and high chancellor. Um, yes. <sighs> We've gotten, you know, yeah, we we need to be better about that, Sister Diane. Um, National needs to be a little bit better as well, because right now, I think the, the previous Garvey voices were $3. This most recent one, they bumped up to $5, and that's our cost that we pay. Um, so previously, we would sell, we would try to sell the Garvey voice at $5 to make a $2 profit. Um, now we have to sell it at seven dollars uh, to make a profit. So, um, two things: one, uh, we have to get that cost down somehow. But at, uh, on the back end, we as a division and as a local region, we have to be better about supporting um, that propaganda and promoting and 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 moving that propaganda. Um, we've purchased a few, you know, um, in the past. We purchased a hundred. Uh, at one time, but we haven't really had a consistent, uh, I would say, like subscription program uh, where we can, you know, every, you know, issue that comes out. And I think it comes out, it was supposed to come out quarterly, but I think it may be biannually. But every time it comes out, we have a a customer base. Anything else? Uh, does that answer your question, Sister Diane? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So that, that takes care of propaganda. And um, as brother Eric uh, rightfully said, tonight's lesson, uh, we're focusing on our reading of communism. Um, and once we finish this, we'll get into uh, Mr. Garvey's lesson on commercial and industrial intercourse. So communism is a very, sh a fairly short lesson for questions. So we'll knock this out. Um, we should knock this out fairly quickly. Uh, first question, what is communism? And what is the desire of communism, according to Mr. Garvey uh, and the course of African philosophy? Communism is a white man's creation to solve his own political and economic problems. White man's creation uh, to solve his own political and economic problem. Does that include the desire to solve his own political? Yeah. It it was or we was you looking for the part that like it was founded? No. Well, let me see what I I don't know. I look I'm like... sorry, it suggests the enthronement of the white working class over the capitalistic class of race. No, I could keep going because it gives like detail. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah um okay, let me let me According, uh, according to Garvey, you know. what I've got a white man's creation to solve his own political and economic problems, white working class over the capitalistic class of the race. Uh, let me go to the text. See how that came about. Communism is a white man's. Uh, so again, for, for this is lesson 17. We are reading um, Course of African Philosophy. This goes straight to the cover. Yeah, this is the text that we're reading, uh, the blue and white text, edited by Honorable uh, Tony Martin and forward by Fifth President General uh, Honorable Charles L. James. <clears throat> but uh, again, while I'm going through this for this text, as it is described in the introduction, the preface in the foreword, um, was the closest thing to a book written by the right excellent Marcus Mosiah Garvey, 
uh, and it was written specifically for the purpose of carrying out uh, the work of the UNIA after his transition. So this is a fundamental component of Division 421 uh, of the UNIA. So uh, Lesson 17 is titled Communism. Starts, it says, Communism is a white man's creation to solve his own political and economic problems. It suggests the enthronement of white working class over the capitalistic class of the race. Uh, it was conceived by white men who were in sympathy with the economic struggle of their own white masses. Uh, I think I, don't, I think that's the next question, who made it? But uh, Excellent. Um, Excellent, Lady President. Also uh, added the Google definition, and that's one thing. Again, the power to define. Um, these are English words. They have, you know, English definitions. Um, but Mr. Garvey gives his definition of these words as well. But according to Google, communism is a political theory advocating class war and leading to a society in which all property is publicly owned, and each person works and is paid according to a, their according to their abilities and needs, um, but uh, we have to know both, uh, both of those. Okay, yeah, this is a better question. Who created communism? And what did the creator of communism know about African people? Who created communism? Karl Marx created communism. Karl Marx. And he knew very little about Africans. He knew very little about Africans? What what was the rest of that quote? And though, and he, and he wrote even less about them. Yes, I thought he wrote and spoke, but uh, he, he who thought and wrote. Ah, there, he knew very little about Negroes. Uh, thought and wrote uh, even less about them. So. Um, yes, uh, just briefly for a second paragraph in lesson 17, it was founded principally on the theory of Karl Marx, who knew very little about Negroes and who thought and wrote less about them. Um, so it was not conceived for our people. Um, but one thing to keep in mind about this that I've learned over the years Although communism may not be as popular or, or as, as talked about as it was, this lesson can be applied to any political ideology. Um, I think, Lady President, you were here. I think you were here. I don't know if you were. No, I don't think you were. But uh, we had talked about it from a, a kind of a Democrat and Republican uh, standpoint one year. Um, but it's basically we have to we have to question all of these political ideologies. Who created them? What did they create them for? Um, and <clears throat> it it further emphasizes um, the fact that we have to create something for ourselves. Uh, and Mr. Garvey and our ancestors uh, did you know the foundational work uh, of that, and, and it's up to us to to keep that going. But um, we have to establish everything for ourselves, uh, even our own political. Uh, ideologies. All right. Um, what type of people are empowered in a communist government, according to Mr. Garvey? Who gets empowered in a communist government? The ignorant white mass. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, absolutely, Attorney Imhotep. Um, uh, it is dangerous theory of economic political reformation because it seeks to put government in the hands of an ignorant white mass who have not been able to destroy their natural prejudice towards Negroes and other non-white people. So um, communism is not for us. Um, is the foundational introduction of this lesson. Uh, most ignorant prejudice class of the white race, uh, again, according to Mr. Garvey. Um, according to lesson 17, what is the enemy of communism? White man. The white man? 
capitalistic white man. Capitalistic white man. Um, um, does he expound on that? Why does he? Why is a capitalistic white man an enemy of communism? Okay, okay, all right. He, he feels that the capitalists will at least give the black man a chance where um, where the communists will always keep him down. In in essence, um, in essence, and, and I guess we can kind of, let's build on that and that'll help us out with some of the later questions. Uh, the capitalistic does... white man is an enemy of the, of the communists communism for the preservation of his own interests, if nothing more. I'm 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 gonna get to that specifically. Um why does why does Mr. Garvey say that capitalism gives uh, the, the, the the African race a chance over communism? Because you have a chance to compete. Mm. Absolutely. That's that's a great word, compete. Um, uh, the capitalistic white man is the enemy of communism for the preservation of his own interests, if nothing more. No, I got to have more than that. Let's see. What page is that? 135. Yes, the capitalistic white man is the enemy of communism for the preservation of his own interest, if nothing more. Negro, not being industrial. Employment. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it, this is rooted in the fact that we as a people are not an industrial employer. Um, so, we are always looking for we are looking for work that's that's our people um until we get to the place where we can provide work for the most part we're looking for work um so mr garvey felt that capitalism and the competition and the competition that is inherent in capitalism at least gives the black race a chance um and and specifically he's, the way i understood it was we we determine our wages. So if if um, we can undercut individuals, basically. So if someone is is you know going to you know do a job for you know seventy five dollars, we can come and say I'll do it for sixty five. Um, and from a capitalist standpoint, uh, the capitalist, a natural or, or true capitalist, doesn't look at race. They look at they look at price. So if if you're willing to do job A you know, at 100% effort and 100% quality for $75 and someone else is willing to do job A, 100% um, service, 100% quality for $65, a true capitalist is not going to care, you know, whether you're black, white, green or whatever. It's, I will, you know, they want the least amount of output uh, to maximize profit. So, yeah. Any questions, comments on why Mr. Garvey felt that capitalism was, or the white capitalist was an enemy of communism. Yeah, he says, uh, because the white capitalist, capitalist is willing to use anybody who yeah. can contribute the most profit to his industries, regardless of color. Yes. So I know that, that we, we you know, uh, in the past, we've had some, some, some issues kind of reading that, um, where people say, you know, we have an opinion of, no, nah, man, the white man is racist, which, you know, there's some truth there. Um, and, you know, it don't matter if you offer it at a lower price, they're still going to go with somebody else because they're racist. And that's true. Um, but don't mix racism with capitalism from a principle standpoint. Although people can be racist and capitalist, um, 
no, hold on. I don't think I don't think you can truly be racist and capitalist, um, honestly. Um, because let me let me put it to you like this. It's like if there's a, a racist individual, we're not going to say what their race is, but they're a racist individual that does not like black people, but they claim to be a capitalist. If we give them that same example of $75, you know, from a non-black person for the services or $65 from a black person, the racist in them is going to say, I don't want that. I don't want to, I don't want that black person working with me, but the capitalist in them is going to say, I can get the same services at a reduced cost. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you can truly be racist and capitalist at the same time. But that's just my thoughts. That has nothing to do with what Mr. Garvey said um, or 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 um, the lessons in the exam. Brother Eric, you said input. But uh, any questions, comments on that? Um, just the thing to remember is that Mr. Garvey, I mean, this is important, but this it, it requires more review um, and, and well, I'm not going to get into all of that right now with this one question, but I think with the further, with the uh, additional questions, it'll start to make sense. Any questions so far before we move forward? Okay. All right. Wrong slides. All right. Um, according to Mr. Garvey, why did communists want to invite Negroes to join their ranks? According to Garvey. To support their theory that Negroes are communists too. And what does that do? So that if a white employer has to decide between a black communist and a white communist by the appeal of race, the white communist will get the consideration and the advantage. Yes. yes. Um, so, so in a sense, um, communism in Garvey's day, and I don't know if it's still the same today, but... Um, it's like a, you know, a, a bad mark on your name. You know, you are a communist. Um, you, communism is synonymous with, or it's against, you know, the ideas of democracy, uh, against the ideas of capitalism, which would be in a sense against uh, a lot of the principles of America. So when you are labeled as a communist, that is a, you know, that's, that's a bad mark on your resume. Um, and we already have to carry around the bad mark uh, of being black, you know. So it's it's two bad marks. Now you're not just black, but you're you're a black communist. Um, and uh, what Mr. Gari says, let's see what the next question is. Um, from a competition standpoint, you know, again we're going back to that capitalism competition. Um, if 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 it's a white communist and a black communist. Um, Garvey, Mr. Garvey said that they will go with the white communists first, um, just because they're not black. But questions, comments on that. But uh, that's why Mr. Garvey said communists wanted to invite Negroes to join their ranks so that Negroes can be labeled as communists. And that automatically puts them, um, makes them more qualified uh, for for when it comes to c competing for jobs. <clears throat> so we have to be careful of allowing other people to, to assign us labels. All right, number six, all the outrages in war, mob violence, extreme punishment were done about what class of people, according to Mr. Garvey? What class of people is responsible for those things?
white people? What kind of white people? The common white, white man. What's that? The common white man. No, not the common white man. I got mm -hmm. the lowest class. Lowest class of white agents um, is what Mr. Garvey says. So again, um, from a knowledge standpoint, we talk about propaganda. Propaganda is, is um, an idea that's produced by a small group of individuals. Um, so uh, that's one thing that we have to realize as Garveyites is um, Oh, you know, ignorance is is profound, uh, and it's not just you know uh, relegated to to our race, but there are several uh, ignorant individuals of other races, and and Garvey says that uh, that's one of our our biggest. Well, I think he says that later, but um, what he says here is when it is considered that all the outrages in war, mob violence, and extreme punishment have been administered to the Negro by the lowest class of white agents. Uh, as soldier in war, as sailors, and as a mob, the Negro should have no doubt that his greatest enemy is the common white man who does not have enough intelligence to know the injury that he does to the race, even if he is paid to do so by his master. So um, I think that's the actually next question is um, our greatest enemy, but it's not all white people basically. Um, and, and sometimes we'd be lashing out uh, and getting mad at the wrong people. Um, sometimes they're just ignorant um, beneficiaries, so to speak, of of their race. But we end up making them look like, you know, they the, they the brainchild of the, of the project or the program. Questions, comments? Yeah. Uh, he Gary says, uh, because this uh, lower class of white agents, white people uh, does not have enough intelligence to know the injury that he yep. is doing to a race. Yes. And I don't think they really care about the, hmm. the injury that they're doing to a, another race. Well, I don't think they care about the injuries they do to their own race. Uh, Attorney Emo tell me. Well, at the end of the day, it's it's still, I would argue from a Garvey perspective, it's still ignorance because what Garvey what Garvey says is um we all the the world is dependent on all of us. Um and if one, you know, it's almost like extinction. If if one um race is, you know, no longer here, the world can kind of go out of balance. Um so from a health of the world perspective, uh, Mr. Garvey believes that uh, every race uh, has their their position or their purpose. Uh, so if you, you know, by injuring a particular race or setting back a particular race, um, it, you know, it affects, you know, the entire world, basically. <clears throat> and that that affects even those that are doing the harm, um, so. But it puts the whole world out of order. That's that's the argument that I that I understand. Um, all right, let me let me because I think that is actually the next question. Yeah, who is the greatest enemy? Who is the Negro's greatest enemy? And we just said that. Uh, the Negro should have no doubt that his greatest enemy is the common white man who does not have enough intelligence to know the ignor the injury that he is doing to a race, uh, even if he is paid to do so by his master. So I, I take that as, you know, ignorance of the, as we've talked about that universal knowledge, you know, the connection of all things. So, all right. Common white man who does not have enough intelligence to know the in injury that he is doing to a race. All right, th four more questions. Uh, number eight, the mob has always been made of what type of people? What type of people make up mobs according to Mr. Garvey? Negroes. 
the lowest class of the white race? Um, Common ignorant people from yep. whom communists yep. are made up of and whom the party is intended to give political power and economic advantage. Yes. So, yeah, it's, it's anybody else want to say something? I'm sorry. Um, but that understanding of the common white man, the ignorant white man, uh, I'll read this whole paragraph because it's related. All wars in Africa, and this just follows up on the previous paragraph, all wars in Africa and the colonies where the natives have been shot down and punished were carried out by the common white man in the ranks. In the lynchings that have occurred in the southern section of the United States of America, the mob has always been made up of the lowest class of the white race. No governor, state official, or major aristocrat has ever been found in the mob or leading the mob. Mob has always been made up of the common ignorant people from whom communists are made up and whom the party is intended to give political power. Dang, I think I just read the next question. All right, but yeah, common uh, white man. Questions, comments on that? Lowest class of the race, common ignorant people from whom communists are made and whom parties intend to live. All right. Yeah, there was really uh, just wasn't uh, lynchings in the South. There was lynchings in the North. Um, there's a famous one in Indiana. Um, it's in the Black Book. Uh, two brothers, I think, being hanged at the same time, maybe two or three. Hmm. And, and uh, Malcolm X always used to say, uh, stop talking about the South. If you are South of the Canadian border, you're South. <laughs> I got you. Yes. Yeah. You're right. Anyone else? Any comments, questions on that? Okay, uh, number nine, who carries the expense of economic improvements, according to Lesson 7 on communism? Who carries the expense of economic improvements? And I would assume this is uh, of a community. And we lost Sister Diane. Um, yeah, who carries the expense of economic improvements in a society? All right, all right, all right. We got a we got a tough that's a that's a, it had to be an exam question. Is it the um it it said the exploitation of lower the lower class, the exploitation, the exploitation of people of under. Um yes, yes, brother Eric, you, you are right. Um yeah. let me let me find it in the text. Do you have it in the text? Do you want to read it in the text? Oh uh, yeah, hold up. It it's on. You you have it. You just showed it in the things right there. Though. It's on one thirty seven. Oh yeah. The weaker peoples before were the Chinese, the East Indians, and the Negroes. Oh, I think it's one more above one. It uh, is evident. Really? One thirty six. One thirty seven. Yeah. Consider that the socialists, the communists, and the trade unions. Yeah. It's yeah, there it is. It is evident yeah. that these economic improvements must only come at the expense of greater exploitation of weaker people. So uh, consider that the socialists, communists, and the trade unionists of the right, white race are all agitating for higher wages and better living conditions. Uh, so if if these parties get into power and they want higher wages and better living conditions, uh, Mr. Garvey says, 
Um, these economic improvements must only come at the expense of greater exploitation of the weaker people. Uh, and the weaker people, as we know, um, from an organization standpoint, are, are those that are not organized vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, Black people. Uh, so, you know, again, we have to organize. We have to be self-determined, self-reliant, uh, have our own will um, before someone else gives that to us. We have to have our own programs before we follow someone else's. Mm -hmm. The weaker people before were the Chinese, the Indi East Indians, and the Negroes. Uh, the Chinese have organized national resistance. The Indians have also organized national resistance. Therefore, the only the Negro who was exposed to the most ruthless exploitation is left to be exploited in the future. So, yes, we just have to be aware of these things. You know, if we help others to get into power, um, as Mr. Garvey says, you know, according to, to his experience, when these individuals want a, a better life, higher wages, um, that will be at the expense of uh, the weaker people, those that are those that are not organized, those that do not have a strong political voice. Um, those will be the ones that are taken advantage of. Questions, comments? Real quick, President, um, if you could, how do you feel about that today? How what do you feel about that theory about today? What do you mean? I still feel like it's a true statement. Um, it's it's a as Mr. Garvey said, and this is this is some this is a this is not a new theme that he presented in this lesson. Um, he talked about you know war. Um, what did he say that war was? Do we remember? War is in propaganda. Damn it. It's got to be. Yeah, it's the second half of propaganda. My personality. I just saw a P. Yeah, where did the first war start? Okay, okay. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Are you looking for Period. wars, the hellish passion of man let loose on opposition to man? Yes. Um, and the aims of war. It sums up the cruelty of man towards man. It always aims at the stronger taking advantage of the weaker to gain that which could not have been required otherwise. So there's always been a common theme of the strong taking advantage of the weak. Um, and, you know, you can look at that as a physical, you know, standpoint in nature, you know, the stronger um you know animals become the dominant become the alpha um but from a you know from our standpoint we look at it from an organization standpoint the most organized are the strongest uh and they take advantage of those that are weak those that are not organized that's that's the um that's the takeaway for that lady president but so yeah, that, that does exist So okay, is it organization or economics? I would argue more. Well, I don't know. I mean. Because the militarily strong, stronger, not like strength or whatever, but the ones who are stronger militarily, especially in this day and age, are the ones who dominate. As Dr. Johnson, I heard him say, what, he said, organize, or a weak but people who have weak organization are people who have weak political and economic or are weak politically and economically. And that's where I was going is I feel like it's synonymous. They're all synonymous. Um, to, to be strong or organizationally is to be strong economically, to be strong economically is to be strong organizationally uh, as well as politically. So as 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 Garvey said, you know, a strong man is strong, you know, everywhere, um, but not just in one category.
But yeah, I would I would say those are synonymous. Um, but I would still say again, yes, this is a reality of existence. Uh, strong take advantage of the week. <clears throat> This spelled all wrong. Okay. Uh, if the, uh, any other questions before we proceed? Okay. Last two questions. What must the Negro do in regards to the commun? What must the Negro do in regards to communism, and why? I don't remember this. It's a tough one. Don't. Uh, don't. Don't. Just don't do it. It's not for you, not for us, not for us. Uh, Just don't do it. It's not for us. Yeah, it's uh, it sense. wasn't it wasn't made by somebody who knows. It said he wasn't. It said he didn't know about us. Right, right. Um, yes, in, in in that sense, you're absolutely right, brother Eric. It's not for us. Leave it alone. Anyone else want to add to that? Yes, what the Negro must do is to let the communists fight their own battles and stand back oh, I'm sure. and watch the fight. Yep, absolutely. Um, let them fight their own fight. Let them do their thing. Um, we have to focus. We have to do our thing. And that's that's something that we as a people have had difficulty with uh, is, is staying focused on our own programs um, and developing uh, our own programs. But we 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 quick to jump on uh, somebody else's program, uh, and we got to stop doing that. So yeah, let them fight their fight, let them do their thing. And last question: Let the communists fight their own battles and stand back and watch the fight. Uh, he would uh, he would be helping to bear the brunt of the battle with no guarantee that his condition will be better, but objectively worse because he will help to transfer government from the more intelligent and more cultured in behavior to that of the ignorant, more prejudiced, and most cruel. Um, so there's a, a sentiment, if you haven't picked up, um, where Garvey correlates capitalism with um, intelligence and culture, and he co uh, correlates communism um, with um, the lack thereof. <clears throat> so... He says we'll be helping to transfer government to the more ignorant of the class. Last question. When we are asked to join the Communist Party, what should our response be? Man, we know to leave it alone. Uh, we leave it alone. But if we are approached, say, hey, you know, you should join the Communist Party. What what should we what should our response be? And when you get to Russia, but not before then. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, anytime you're asked to join the Communist Party by your communist associate or acquaintance, tell him an answer. When you get to Russia, but not before then. Um, so, again, let them fight their own fights. Uh, let them win their own victories. Um, and basically that's what Mr. Garvey's saying. Um, you know, when you win your victory, I'll join, uh, but I'm not going to help you fight. Uh, and I'm not going to help you um, to get a, you know, a, a, pos a position of advantage uh, over me. So uh, read statement on communism and the Negro in the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. So uh, I don't have that prepared right now. Um, that's some homework for everybody. Uh, read the sentiments or statements on communism and the Negro and philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey. Any questions, comments on Lesson 17? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, are we making good with time or kind of sort of? That was a very short lesson and it still took us about 45 minutes. So um, we want to start the reading for lesson 18. Um, is anyone, Lady President, will you be reading or someone want to read? Nobody? All right, y'all chilling today.
Okay. It's 903. We ain't got time. <clears throat> Lesson 18, commercial and industrial transactions. Um, so this is, uh, we, we had a lesson on economy early on um, that was more so kind of geared towards personal savings um, and making sure we, we had a reserve, make sure we don't exhaust our financial, um, you know, our finance, our finances. This lesson here is more so getting into, um, yeah, business, um, the different types of businesses and Garvey's understanding, you know, of, of how we can be profitable uh, from a, from a, a business standpoint, but it goes beyond our personal finances at, for this lesson. So I'm in the chat. Apologies. Ha. Got you. Got you. Thank you, Lady President. Uh, we have our distinguished guest, Lady President from uh, Philadelphia. All right. Lesson 18, commercial and industrial transactions. I'm more so, you know, I'm, I'm talking to my um, Atlanta. Uh, lesson 18, commerce and industry are the feeding props of the economic life of the state, the community or society as a whole. On these two foundations rests the universal system of exchange with its financial factors. Every progressive people and nation indulge in some form of commerce and industry, manufacturing or agricultural industry. It is by such activities that in individuals find occupation within the normal life of the state. You are either an employer or an employee, big or small. The employees are those who work for the employers. The employers are those who employ the employees and pay them salaries or wages. The employers pay themselves salary out of their profits or dividends. So both employer and employee live off commerce and industry. Uh, so we're getting into the foundational concepts, um, you know, more so employer and employee um, yeah, relationship. Those who do not work, those who do not work in this way are either wards of the state or recipients of charity or people who live off the earnings of others, which flow from those who are industrious enough to work either as an employer or an employee. Every self-respecting man finds an occupation, either as an employee or as an employer, according to his choice. With his ability and general fitness, he earns a livelihood. All men try to earn as much as they possibly can. To do so, they generally equip themselves for their occupation. A good laborer or worker qualifies himself for his particular work so as to demand the best reward or wages. The businessman, proprietor, or employer generally goes into the most profitable business so as to secure the largest amount of profit. The man without a business or without his own Wait, hold on. A man without a business of his own or without training to perform a particular type of job is always at the disadvantage in making a living. Great wealth is made out of commerce and industry. Also, the professions, also the professions which depend upon commerce and industry. Uh, so we got to be we got to be when we talk about the economy, we talk about making funds, uh, making money. We got to be talking commerce and industry. Or we should be talking commerce and industry. Commercial enterprises are of different kinds. Are um, commercial enterprises are of different kinds, as are industrial enterprises. In commerce, we have the grocery business, the lumber business, the ironmongers business, the mercantile business or dry goods business, the clothing business, the tailoring business, retail and wholesale businesses of all kinds. Industrial yes, sir. <laughs> industrially we have manufacturing business that manufactures the particular articles of commerce while the farming industry produces such commodities that are necessary for human consumption the industrious man finds an occupation in one or the other of these enterprises or professions if he is to be a proprietor or an employer he must have his own wholesale establishment or retail establishment. He must have his own factories or mills, either large or small. 
His capital may be a million dollars or ten dollars, according to the size of his enterprise. One proprietor has a chain of grocery stores. Another has a push cart with his wares on it. But both of them are proprietors. At the end of a week, one may make a profit of ten thousand dollars of his investment. The other may make a profit of ten dollars. This is due to the difference in size of the business. Um, I wish our first vice president was here because that. That um goes back to something that he he said, um, but he said like it it takes just as much effort to make uh five hundred dollars as it does to make five hundred thousand dollars or something like that. And um, Mr. Garvey, it's it's about scale. Uh, so we we have to understand scale. So a man who is enterprising with little capital can start a business of his own equally or simultaneously with the man who has large capital. One farmer may be the proprietor of 10,000 acres of land. Another farmer may be the proprietor of one acre of land, but both of them are farmers and proprietors. Often it is small, off, wait, hold on, I'm, I'm messed up. Okay. Often it is the small proprietor who ultimately becomes a large proprietor through the success of his small venture. Most of the successful businessmen in the world started with a small amount of capital. Rockefeller started with a dollar and so did Carnegie. Henry Ford started with less than $50, but they both became great trust magnates in less than half a century. They opened the way for enterprising men who are willing to start with a modest or small beginning and work steadily to build a business of greater magnitude. The examples of small men starting small businesses and building them up to massive concerns are common. Massive concerns are common. In England, Joseph Lyons, a Jew starting with less than $10 capital, built the great Joseph Lyons Company tea room and restaurant syndicates that controlled the catering trade in all of Great Britain. This was also true of Thomas Lipton, who afterwards became Sir Thomas Lipton, the great tea magnate of England. This kind of enterprising success has its counterpart in nearly every country in the world where small men have grown big by entering a business and sticking to a business until it becomes a colossal success. Many an Italian millionaire started with a push cart selling oranges and bananas in the streets of New York and Chicago. Many Greeks also became millionaires by starting with a small lunch counter at some side street corner with capital not more than $10. Many an Assyrian peddler started peddling with a box slung across his soldier containing assorted merchandise not valued at more than $5. To become a millionaire or merchant, prince, <clears throat> and proprietor of a dry goods establishment later. Um, I hope y'all got that. Many an enterprising boy started out with 35 cents to buy newspapers and sell them. The morning and afternoon editions and climbed up to be a great newspaper publisher or proprietor. The fault with the Negro in business becomes the, the fault. Uh, the fault with Negro, the fault with the Negro in business, commercial or industrial, has been his inability to appreciate starting at a giving point and start in, in climbing steadily. While other races have been willing to start from the bottom and climb up, the Negroes have always desired to start from the top. Therefore, he comes down. No success ever comes from the top. It always, it is always from the bottom up. The Negro must learn to climb from the bottom up. He will never be an industrial or commercial factor until he has learned the principles of commercial and industrial success. These principles are as much open to him as to anybody else. Um, and we should remember, um, I can't remember the exact lesson, but Mr. Garvey said one of the mistakes that um, our people make in business is the inability to start small. Um, so he's repeating uh, that principle in this lesson. Find a particular kind of business that you would like to engage yourself in because you can make a profit because you can make it profitable and start with whatever capital you have. You can start selling newspapers with a capital of 25 cents. You can start selling oranges with a capital of one dollar. You can start selling stockings for ladies with a capital of two dollars. You can start selling ties for gentlemen with a capital of two dollars. Find out what your neighbors want most and are willing to buy. Start selling. I, I love that part. Uh, find out what your neighbors willing to buy. Or the whole thing. The, I'm sorry, the part where it said um the whole thing. Yep. The whole thing. We could we could sell it for a dollar. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
uh, start selling it to them, if not in a shop, by going door to door. If your capital is larger, your, your opportunities become larger and easier. But no Negro need, uh, need sit down at his doorstep and mourn his bad luck if he has 25 cents in his pocket to start a business. And again, um, this was written in 1930 or originally created in 1934. Um, we, we should apply uh, inflation to, to these numbers. Um, if you invest 25 cents wisely at nine o'clock, in the morning, by six o'clock in the evening, you may have 50 cents. If you eat 10 cents for the day and carry over 40 cents to the next day as a capital from nine o'clock to six o'clock on the next day, you may have 75 cents. Uh, eat another 10 cents out of the 75 cents, which you will which will leave you with capital for the next day of 65 cents. Your 65 cents capital may bring you 90 cents. Eat 10 cents and carry over the 80 cents for the following day. And at six o'clock on that day, you may have $1.20. Eat 10 cents and carry over $1.10 to the business of the next day. And at six o'clock on the next day, you may have $1.50. And so you follow this method for one year. And at the end of that year, you may have a capital in business, may be $25 and your income may be $5 on that day, out of which you provide your food and still have a large capital to face the next day. In five years, uh, in five years, your capital may be $1,000. In 10 years, your capital may be $10,000. In 50 years, you may be a millionaire. Uh, that is how Rockefeller did it. That is how Carnegie did it. And they left their impression upon the world as self-made men. So again, we multiply these numbers, um, but this, you know, these are the numbers that Garvey used in his time. How do, how do I, or uh, how do I access this? Um, I will send you, I'll send it to you. Um, I'll send it to you this evening. Thank you. Yeah, it, we, we it's a it's a free link. Um, it's about ninety, I'll say ninety percent of the text is uh, available online through this link. There are some pages uh, towards the end that are not available, but um, you you know you get you get more than enough um, from the free link. That's a nice link, Mister President. Not a problem. Um, okay. Okay, I'll continue. If the Negro is going to look at Marshall Field or Sears and Roebuck in Chicago, John Wanamaker in Philadelphia or Gordon Selfridge in London, England and say, I want to work like that, the dreamer will never start because nothing starts that way. Wanamaker had to climb from the ground to the top of his skyscraper by perseverance and plotting and so did Selfridge and Marshall Field. They all started from the ground floor, ground floor climbing up. The Negro must start from the ground floor of commerce and industry and climb up. Uh, when he can make a good handkerchief, a good handkerchief, then later he will make a uh, gross. Uh, then, uh, wait, hold on. When he can make a good handkerchief, then later he will make a gross. And then a million gross with his factory going at top speed. So um, basically, uh, gross is like profit. When he can make a single tie successfully, he will make gross, then hundreds of gross, then thousands of gross, and his factory will hum and buzz with activity. But uh, again, it's about, um, it's two things. It's it's the the uh, cultivation, and I, that's the word I was trying to think of the other night. It's the cultivation of resources, um, you know, just pulling things from the ground and, and selling them as is or pulling them off the tree, selling them as is. Uh, and then there's the refinement of these resources. So um, the refinement of, of silks, you know, into fabrics um, that um, that increases your profit. Uh, so we have to understand um, both of those aspects, the, the cultivation and the, the refinement. <clears throat> Um, businesses are necessary, shops, stores, wholesale and retail, and factories. These are the places where the majority of the people are employed outside the farm. The Negro to be employed and to be the Negro to be employed and to be his own employer must have his independent farms, stores, factories, and mills. But he must start as the white man did, growing from a single room of industry into the mighty factory on the hillside of the plain. 
Without commerce and industry, a people perish economically. The Negro is perishing because he has no economic system, no commerce and industry. There are tricks in every business. Never go into any business until you know all the tricks thereof. Otherwise, you are bound to fail. Um, again, from our previous lesson, we talked about two reasons why we fail. Um, one of them, well, I think it's really three, because one of them is like a lack of capital. Um, but one, we, we talked about um, not starting small, a lack of capital. So it's really three. Not starting small, lack of capital and not having enough knowledge of that business. And that's what Mr. Garvey is, is explaining uh, further in this lesson. He said, they, there are tricks in every business. Never go into any business until you know all the tricks thereof. Otherwise, you are bound to fail. If you like to indulge or engage yourself in a certain line of business, spend as much time as you possibly can investing from your friends, acquaintances, or whoever you can approach who is already in that business, business or knows about that business so as to have all the information necessary about it before you start. It is the people who know of the tricks in the trade that make the most profit. It is the people that know the tricks of the trade that make the most profit out of the trade. If you are going to sell ripe bananas on a truck through the streets, find out how long a banana fully ripe will last in handling so, as, so that you may gauge the time of the sale of the bananas that they may not spoil on your hands. So with oranges, salt, fish, meat, ribbons, hats, shoes, or anything that time and age will affect. Uh, if you do not know about the particulars of these things and invest in, in them, you will find yourself losing money uh, instead of making it. So we have to be also, and that's one thing that Mr. Garvey kind of, in that example that he gave, <clears throat> he was always successful. Well, he was fairly successful. He didn't always double his funds, but he always made a profit. Um, we have to get better about that. But sometimes we make investments uh, and we don't make a profit. Um, we got to, you know, but that's where the savings comes in. Uh, we we don't, all, we, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. <coughs> all right, let me try to finish this. No one goes into business just for fun or pleasure, but for profit and results. Study all the possible means of making profit and getting results out of the business in which you are to engage yourself. A democracy is the safest kind of government for persons of individual initiatives who desire to go into business to live to live under. Wait, hold on. Give me one second. Let me get some water. <laughs> No one goes into business. I got, I got, I got. Oh. Hey, President, you want, you want to do it? No, not if you got President. I ain't know how long you're going to be gone. I'm just going to read a paragraph or two. Thank you. That, you, no, got, yeah. you all right? You got yeah. it? <clears throat> yes. Um, I'm at property. I want you to take over, okay? Okay. Let right, me just finish this last paragraph. <laughs> A democracy is the safest kind of government for persons of individual initiatives who desire to go into business to live under because it is because it gives every man a chance to do business more safely. As a fact, the capitalist of today was the laborer or worker of yesterday. Most of the capitalists of our present age were workers 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 or five years ago. Hence, the man who wants to go into business commercially, industrially or agriculturally and win a fortune for himself cannot and should not be a communist because communism robs the individual of his personal initiative and ambition for the result thereof. Democracy, therefore, is the kind of government that offers the individual the opportunity to rise from a laborer to the status of a capitalist or employer. Um, one second. But what Garvey's saying there at the end is he's he's promoting the um he promotes the competition that capitalism uh inherent within capitalism uh and he says that capitalism um you know causes you to to have a a stronger drive as opposed to communism with capitalism um you have to to get it yourself you know with communism things are somewhat given to you so the motivation for for that additional drive is not there <clears throat> Um, Lady President. Okay, okay. Property. 
and acquiring property for commercial, industrial, or personal or personal purposes or use, always see that you get value for your money. The property market is regulated by the real estate brokers or agents and the mortgaging and trust companies who take mortgages on property. These people create the rise and fall in property values to suit their own conveniences and their own profits. When they can get the public to buy at high value, they induce the public to do so. When the public will not buy enough to ensure their profit, they reduce the value of property and then encourage the buying of same. When the buying takes a gradual rise, they inflate the values again to make the public pay more for what they have started to started to buy again. As far as Negroes are concerned, the custom of the real estate brokers and mortgaging companies has always been to sell them property at one fourth, one third, and sometimes one half, and other times one hundred percent higher than the real value. When the when the Negro is ready to sell, he never. When the Negro oh, is ready to sell, he never gets half of what he paid for his property, except except in exceptional cases. It is always suggested su suggested that his ownership and particular particularly his occupancy carries depreciation. Therefore, to be safe, when the Negro is purchasing property. He should first go to the official registry of property transfers in his community for a record of titles to find out the price paid for the property by the last purchaser so that he will know how much he is being charged in excess of the last sales price. He should also go to the government registry where the, the government reg registry where the particular property is assessed for tax taxation to find out the real value from the government point of view for the property. Government assessed value on property is always about two thirds of its ordinary market commercial value. And on one third of the government assessment. Wow. Hey, this sorry. is all online. He um, brought all this motherfucker. Uh oh, brother Sam, Maybe you are mute, baby. Oh, shit. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh I'm sorry, y'all. The government says value on property is always about two thirds of its ordinary. I'm sorry, was I right there? You was on add one third. Add one third to the government assessment, and you will find the real market value of the property. Never pay an X in excess of this value, except you can except you can afford to stand the loss to suit your own convenience. Because when you want to sell your property, that is, when because when you want to sell your property, that is the method others will adopt to find out its real value. Always be careful and watch your mortgage or the person you have bought the property from, to whom you, to whom you owe balances after you have paid off the excess value of the property and started to pay on the real value. When the mortgager or the seller of the property sells it to you in excess of its value, he is always friendly and tolerant while you are paying off the excess value because he realizes he is the one who was benefiting all the time. But when you start to pay on the real value of the property to have equity in, in, in it that will make it, I'm sorry, but when you start to pay on the real value of the property to have equity, in it that will make it marketable equity, he becomes nervous in the belief that you may you may pay off property and own it. The more you pay off on the real value of the property, the more nervous he becomes because he is always counting on your inability to pay for the property. So as to foreclose on you to sell the property a second time and so as to make a double profit out of the access value. That is to say, if he sells you the property originally at an excess value of $1,000, he will encourage you to pay off the $1,000 with the tolerance because all, because all that is gross, gross profit. But he is always hoping to have the property to sell to another person at another excess value of $1,000. He can only have it when, when you have forfeited your regular payments on the real value to make it possible for him to foreclose. Therefore, 
He may trick you into being off guard to pay your first interest in sinking fund reg regularity. Then in the first lapse of unpreparedness, he serves you by foreclosing and gets the property in his hands again for his second attempt. This is the method of all you well, ursurers? <laughs> Usurers. Say that one more time. Usurers. Usurers. <laughs> Usurers who take mortgages and property and who deal with the property as a business. If you will navigate, I'm sorry, if you will investigate, you will find that the majority of Negroes in every country have lost their property in this way. Charitable, let me keep going, President. Yeah, yeah, but uh, that's a test question of how um, Negroes have lost their property. So keep that in mind. But yes, if you could, please continue. Charitable institutions. Charity suggests that charity suggests the sympathy and goodwill of the fortunate. For of the fortunate, for the unfortunate. The poor we shall have with us always, and no one knows who shall be the poor. And so we become kindly in our behavior and disposition towards those who are unable to help themselves through misfortune or bad circumstances of any kind. To properly dispense kindness to those in need, society decides on the establishment of institutions for charity the these may be hospitals homes for the homes for the age homes for the blind foundling institutions asylums etc all well organized races have such institutions for their own and contribute and support them the negro must be interested in the foundling and and the keeping of such institutions for his own people in giving charity to a worthy cause, nothing is lost. In fact, it is like casting your casting your bread upon the waters to come back to you after many days. You may help to do a, you may help to do good to a member of your race without personally knowing the person. And ten years hence, some relative of that person may help some relative of yours without knowing them. It is the bread coming back upon the waters. To give charity outside your race is probably sending it too far away. But to give it within your race is probably handing it to your own relative. In fact, charity begins at home and your race is much nearer to you than a, neighbor, than a neighboring one. So always find time to bestow charity upon your race first. Every Negro helped from the ground to stand up is every... Ever sorry, read that over. Every Negro help help from the ground to stand up is another man set on the journey of racial responsibility. I always seek to help your Negro, I always seek to help your Negro brother. Never allow him to fall because as low down as he goes, he may ultimately pull you down with him. As high as you can send him, he might ultimately pull you up with him. Let us then push everyone of the race up and not down. To help a Negro boy or girl become a useful man or woman is probably to assist in giving to the world and a great character who never would have found himself or herself, but for the early help he received from you or your charitable institutions. Try to educate the boys and the girls who have no parents. Try to assist those who have no one to depend on. Never let orphans go astray or fall into the hands of other races. They will only make service of them. If you help them within the race, they may, they may yet become the leaders of the race in some particular line of success. Before you give to, other, before you give to others not of your race, think first how much your race needs it and place it there. Never be unkind to your race. Never allow the members of your race to die in poverty. It is all, it is your fault. It is, it is your fault if, if they do. Always put yourself in the position of the unfortunate fellow and ask, how would I like to be in this stead? How, how would I like to be in his stead? If your feelings and conscience rebel against his condition, then help him out of it. If you can, 
And as much as you do unto him, so may others do unto you in your time of hour of need. In your time or hour of need. Whenever you find your own racial institutions worthy, support them. In any community in which you live, always seek to have your own charitable institutions. If the public funds are used for charity, then seek to get a portion for your group. Separate and separate, separate and distinct from that of from that of others, because you may not desire charity for yourself. For the time being, why should why should you not support the appeal for charity for those of your for those of our race who may need it? One may be prosperous today on his own initiative and account, and by misadventure lose the natural ability of self-initiative to become to, to become dependent upon charity. You may lose your eyes, arms, or legs. You may lose your health without contributing to it personally, but purely by accident. In that case, you will become a recipient of charity without your expecting it or contributing to the cause. So charity should always be maintained for its own to benefit those who may be unfortunate enough to need it. And the next person to need it may be you. No one can tell. So never frown upon a worthy cause and never refuse to give and support if you can afford it. If you can afford it. Race first. Race first. Uh, thank you, Lady President. It is 934. Um want to open the floor of questions, comments. Um on open floor of questions, comments. We're supposed to close honestly at nine thirty-five. Um, we've kind of gone over in the past, but um, we do have guests tonight, so um, I just want to open the floor before we do anything else. So, questions, comments, anything. Uh, we will have detailed questions on lesson eighteen next week. Um, and we will continue the reading next week, but that's that's the format we read uh, at the end of a Tuesday. And then we kind of review what we read throughout the week. And then the following Tuesday, we have a, a series of questions from that lesson. So next week, we'll have lessons from commercial and industrial intercourse. Okay. Um, all right. Brother Eric. I, I, I have a question. Are we please. doing 19 as well? Well, I'm thinking about it. I ain't want to say nothing. <laughs> yeah, what time? What's that? What what time? What time what? Are we, what time are we free next Tuesday? Like, are we able to, do we need to do it early again? Or, like, organize it for real this time? Or No, we okay. All right. Eight o'clock, right. right. We good. We good. But how does, I mean, anything for today? Because um, to Sister Diane's point, um, from what I remember, winning mankind by kindness. If someone could check, I don't think it's that long. And um, if if it's like a page, I've been saying we can knock this out, President. Right. If we want to. Yeah, we're about we to knock this. Time. I'll okay. read it. <laughs> so yeah, next week, soon. next week, uh, commercial and industrial intercourse, as well as um, lesson nineteen, winning mankind by kindness. Uh, lady, Lady Vice President, Sister Diane, if you would, please. Okay. Lesson 19, Winning Mankind by Kindness. A touch of kindness <clears throat> moves the heart of all men. To be kind is to be generous and to be pleasant, to be inviting in your manner, to be sympathetic and thoughtful of the other fellow's feeling may cost you nothing. You should be kind because sometimes you can extend it you can extend it by a pleasant smile or a pleasant salutation or a good wish to say, I wish you well. I wish you everything that is, that is prosperous. I hope you will succeed. I am sorry to hear of your bad fortune. <clears throat> I hope things will turn out successfully for you. I wish you a long life and joy and happiness and happiness of it in a good, is a good turn. All of these convey to your friend, acquaintances, or even your enemies, a beautiful 
a beauty of thought and soul that wins appreciation and offer and 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 often gratitude if your friend comes to you for help and you cannot give it to him don't turn him away with cold words but with the words of clear of cheer and comfort it may bring him joy in his disappointment even though he does not get the thing he had hoped for you can never tell who is sincere or who is or who is honest therefore you must always be on your guard not to lend your money <clears throat> don't give away your money foolishly because you may never get it back if you are in doubt that you will get back a loan that you will get back a loan to a friend then try never to lend money to that friend because he will become your enemy later offer him a drink of water a piece of cake a delicious fruit and then express your sorrow in ki in kindliest of words <clears throat> or your inability of or your inability to help him at that time and see that when he leaves the gate you smile with him and win his smile in return which is an assurance of parting friend of parting friendship which is probably which probably would not be otherwise if you had bluntly refused his original request win the world to you with a win the world to you with a smile with a hearty shake of the hand with the glad welcome it costs very little it costs less than an ugly stare or the fixed hand of unwelcome in the organization in the organizational life of the UNIA always give to those you want to win give to the poor in the neighborhood and win them over to you give to them from the uh, charitable funds of the organization give them necessities and niceties that they need and cannot buy be kind to the little children of the neighborhood give them candies from the chari charity fund give them pennies to buy candies and these little ones will carry the name of the UNIA through the neighborhood then visit the neighborhood uh, from house to house leave a word of cheer everywhere you go and then persuade them to join the UNIA if they are in trouble console them if the organization can, can help them with advice give it to them if you cannot recommend them to some uh, of officer of the organization who has been well trained for such work have this officer go there and give give the required advice but let your good work be seen and known in the neighborhood and in the community so that they will always come to you for organizational help remember that the organization is for the purpose of helping the needy the distressed and to assist all members of the race who need help it is by by these methods that the catholic church has won the heart the hearts of the people by the charity of its sisterhood and its priesthood helping the sick, the distressed, and restoring them to health. When people have recovered from their bad conditions, their gratitude becomes the pillar on which the church rests. Let the gratitude of the Negro people in your community be the pillar on which the organization in your, the organization rests in your community. There should always be a charitable fund in every division of the UNIA and certain amounts placed at the disposal of responsible representative of the, of the association for the dispensing of charity to the neighborhood in which they live. As a representative of the association, this charity should be disclosed in the name of the organization to maintain its reputation in the community.
Let the tender touch of kindness be everywhere, going from the UNIA to the people in the community. When man will remember you for nothing else, they will remember you for the kindly deed, the touch of sympathy that seldom comes from others, which is the duty of every representative of the UNIA. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Sister. Mm -hmm. that, that's a very well. All mm -hmm. of these lessons are important. Um, I like, yeah, I like all of them. Um, I like how succinct that lesson is. Um, as we've gone through a uh, course of African philosophy, um, gone over all of these several <laughs> lessons, kindness is is bringing us back uh, to the root you know, to the purpose of why we're doing all of this stuff. And that's a perfect, that's a perfect way Mr. Garvey uh, laid this out because he got into commercial and industrial intercourse. But before he even got out of commercial and industrial intercourse, he touched on charity and charitable institutions. Um, so, you know, it gives a purpose behind the capitalism. We're not just trying to obtain and acquire the most amount of resources that we can just for the purpose of doing it but we're doing this to apply them towards our, our charitable inst institutions. Um, so following up that lesson on uh, with kindness, um, you know, it regrounds us. Um, and as we should know, we're at lesson 19. There's really officially 21 lessons, um, written lessons. 22 is, is, is really a plan, but the point is, we're almost, you know, at the finish line um, and, you know, we're wrapping up, you know, if, if we were a present that we were presenting to the world, you know, of our newfound knowledge, uh, we're wrapping up um, that, that present with these last few lessons. So um, as Garvey prepares us to go out into the world to represent the UNIA, to promote for the UNIA, uh, lesson 19 is a perfect reminder um, of our mentality and why we should be why should be do, why ugh, why we should be doing this. Um, lesson twenty is another great lesson. Um, living for something, you know, talking it, it reminds us of you know purpose, self initiative, uh, will. Um, but again, another preparatory uh, to send us out into the world, and then we'll finish up with the history of the UNI, which is extremely comprehensive. Um, and, and, you know, a, a great way to finish out the lessons. Um, and of course the five-year plan, um, that's like our directive. Uh, that's, I feel like that's why we're going through all of these lessons is to implement, uh, the five-year, five-year plan. So I'm, I'm anxious to discuss, you know, to finish out these lessons and, uh, finish up, finish discussion, Mr. Garvey's plan. Any questions, comments before we close out tonight? had a great meeting, uh, great attendance. Um, so anybody I, have anything? I was just going to say, I think it's very important to um, to not ignore charity. Oh, yeah. That charity is, um, I'm looking for my phone cord, my, my phone's, what I did not. with it. Anyway, um, yes, yeah, so I, I think it's it's really good. We have to operate always with charity in mind. And um, to not have a charitable fund is, is kind of sorry. So we really have to focus on um, beefing up the membership so that, you know, things like such of that, things like that is just always there. Yes, yes. And so absolutely. we can participate in the community. And this is in the long run is going to win us more membership. Yes, absolutely. As, as Mr. Garvey said, is casting bread upon the water, you know, to come back to us. These these good deeds, these good acts, um, you know, also, as he said, you know, it's a, in, in intention. Um, these will be the pillars as to which, you know, the, the reputation of the UNI rests once when we when we're able to do charitable acts for the community uh, and the community is able to speak highly uh, of of the UNIA. So. Um, it feeds back into our ability to provide charity. But yes, charity is a fundamental component. Um, we have had a charitable fund in, in, in Division 421 since 2021 officially. But um, 
I will, you know, under my administration, we will not overlook charity. Uh, we've had, you know, feeding programs in the past. Um, you know, we've we've done joint feeding programs in the past. So uh, I am extremely passionate about charity. Uh, I was a recipient of charity, you know, as as a youth. So um, I understand that all too well. Uh, so th that that component is part of the reason why I'm here in the UNIA is that charitable component. Um, I have to be better about the the the, the profitable uh, aspect of it. <clears throat> Anyone else? I want to say like this might have been the smallest chapter in the book, but this is the most impactful. Um, because as Garveyites and as much as we, you know, go through as much as we have to resist, it's always important to be kind. And I think that's something that, you know, Bubba Garvey talks about, you know, even when dealing with other races, even in the preamble, it talks about how we are, a how we are a friendly society, you know, and how we, we, we don't disregard any other races or we don't disregard, you know, any other beliefs or teachings or whatever. So I think, you know, winning mankind with kindness is like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's the most important because it's, it's, it's always implied through all of our ventures and, and, and dealing and as a Garvey and dealing with this, 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 this way of revolutionizing, we have to remember that in all of our dealings, like even when, you know, like in diplomacy, um, it talks about, you know, being uh, kind and, and letting and, and kind of like letting the other ones, like letting other people go before you just so you can like hear what they're saying so you can yep. have a proper way to respond. So, you know, I just think that even though this is the smallest chapter, this is the most impactful as a Garveyite and as a person. Yes. Person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to the representation, the vision of, of the UNIA, you know, I, I agree with you 100%, Lady President, as far as how this this lesson, the, pi the, the picture that this lesson paints. Um, <clears throat> you could argue that <clears throat> this is really like the, 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 a flip on lesson three, uh, the aims and objects of the UNIA, because, you know, that is the fundamental, you know, this is who we are, this is what we stand for, this is our principles, um, but you can be very rigid uh, in that expression. So I like how lesson 19, <clears throat> it's almost like the spirit and the letter. You know, uh, if anybody's worked in corporate America, you have the letter, the, the, you know, how things are supposed to go and how they're supposed to function. But you also have a spirit um, that's applied to that. And I would say lesson 19 uh, embodies that spirit. Um, I just want to read a little bit of it, what I was able to find in regards to what Lady President was saying as, as we were reading through it. Uh, when I read this, this this was kind of a snapshot of of what the UNIA is. So you know, like a Mr. Garvey says, we use the preamble to describe the UNIA to to people, but I think this paragraph um, fits pretty well as well. If the organization can help them with advice, give it to them. If you cannot recommend them to some officer of the organization who has uh, officer organization who has been well trained for such work, have this officer give. Uh, have to have this officer go there and give the required advice, but let your work be seen and known in the neighborhood and the community so that they will uh, always come to your organization. Here we go. Remember that the organization is for the purpose of helping the needy, the distressed, and to assist all members of the race who need help. It is by these methods, uh, it talks about Catholic Church as one of the hearts of the people, by charity or sisterhood, priesthood, helping the sick, the distressed, and restoring them to health. When we... Yeah, and then this was the pillar part. When people have recovered from their bad conditions, their gratitude becomes the pillar on which uh, the church rests. Let their gratitude of the Negro, uh, let the gratitude of Negro people in the community be the pillar on which the UNIA rests in our community. But yes, kindness, charity. <laughs> I love those things. Uh, I love doing those things. Um, but at the same time, though, that comes with funds. Uh, so we don't have the largest charitable fund, but we do have a charitable fund. But the issue is that we usually we can wipe that thing out, you know, with one event. You know, we, we you know, it may take us a couple months to get a couple hundred dollars in the charitable fund. And in one day we, we can use that up. <clears throat> uh, so. 
I like what he said. It's, it's important, too, that charity does begin at home. And if orphanages and things of those of that nature is to be set up, it's better that it's set up by us for our people. Yep. You know, it's the same thing that applies to like education. It's better if we educate our children than leaving up to, to others who know who may not necessarily have their best interest in heart to educate them. Yes. I think it all falls in line with that stuff. But yeah, charity, as you said, charity begins at home and uh, no one is closer than, you know, your family, your race. Is that just reading? Oh, uh, there should be always a charitable fund in every division of the UNIA. That's going to be an exam question as well. But um, to your point, Sister Diane, that's a that's a a mandate, you know, from Mister Garvey, uh, that we should have a charitable fund. So, not only us in Division Four Twenty One, but every division um, should have. Yeah, there should be a charitable fund in every division of the UNIA. So, you know, not only 421, but but every division should should have that, should be promoting that. It should be utilizing that. <clears throat> Anyone else? Uh, 954 before we close out. Well, uh, I don't have anything else. Um, been a good, good, uh, good class for tonight. As I said, we're wrapping it up. Uh, getting ready to finish out. So a few more weeks, then exams. Um, everything in the exam. There's nothing that will be on the exam that that we have not reviewed in the class. So I don't create any new questions. I just pull from what I feel is the most important questions, the most relevant questions from each of the week's study groups. All right, well, I don't have anything else. We will officially close out. Sister Diane, I did want to talk with you briefly about um, the guests for Sunday, if we were still going to have that sister, but let me close out and then we can, uh, if you got a few minutes, just let me know the update. Uh, okay. Sister Diane, you want? Oh, you mean? Oh, um. So what happened? Um, I can reach well, back out. I kind of backed off. Hold on, because sister. I was. We were talking about the calendar. Well, hold on. Hold on. Oh, you... let me close out first, and then we'll. Oh, I'm sorry, my bad. Uh, gotcha. Sister Diane, if you would please, um, uh, could you give us a, uh, the our slogan motto and slogan, please? Okay. Everyone, raise your black fist in the air. Say one God, one God, one aim, one God, one aim, one aim, one destiny, one, one destiny. destiny. Africa. Africa, Africa, Africans for the Africans, for the Africans. those at home, those at home, those at home, and those abroad, and those, and those abroad. abroad. Race first, race first, race first. Race first. Race first. Race first. Race first.